away from the wars now to nature's terror on the United Arab Emirates, which experienced its largest rainfall since records began 75 years ago. It seems it received a year's worth of rain in just 24 hours on Tuesday. 20 people have been killed so far. Cars and passengers were seen stranded in water as the National Center of Meteorology warned the adverse weather, weather conditions could continue, forecasting more waves of thunderstorms heavy rain and strong winds. Disruption to airport operation continued today with access roads blocked by floodwaters and multiple airlines reporting flight delays and cancellations. The weather observations at the airport said nearly four inches of rain fell over in 20 a bigger bun in 12 hours, around what Dubai usually records in an entire year. And like the rest of the United Arab Emirates, Dubai has a hot and dry climate. As such, rainfall is infrequent and in many areas still limited infrastructure such as drainage to handle extreme events. Our correspondent in Dubai, Mayowa Ogundele, joined Mayua Adegoke, I'm sorry. Uh, Mayua Adegoke joins us now. Hopefully she's on dry ground. Mayua, describe to us the experience from Tuesday with all of that rain. So good to see you again. And honestly, well, thankfully for me, I'm on dry ground. I live quite uphill. So my community is not as affected, but that's not a case of cross board. You've got communities greatly impacted by this flooding. And on the one hand, it's quite exciting. You know, everyone's at home, we're sharing videos. We haven't seen anything like this. I mean, for, for myself, I've been here nearly five years. I've never seen anything like this. People who have lived here much longer also say the same thing. So on the one hand, it's exciting. And well, on the other hand, it's quite devastating, especially for those whose homes have been affected, whose cars have been affected. You've got people who had to sleep literally in their cars overnight who, you know, were out last night, ended up at home this morning. So it's quite unprecedented and it's really unfortunate, especially for those who have had to suffer damages of any kind of, and of course, loss as well. Yeah, and, and the last time Dubai experienced or the UAE experienced anything like this was in 1949, you and I. We're not there at the time. Uh, and I know that very few people can remember, you know, what the scenario was like back then. But the Meteorological Agency says you, you, the UAE received a year's rainfall in just 24 hours. I'm just imagining, just looking at the pictures, I mean, how much water that is. And with the, the city just, you know, not being prepared for this, not having enough drainages for this, how high were the floods? And talk to us about you know, some of the damages. You talked about people sleeping in their cars. Did those cars start at all? And how did people get water out of their homes? I think it's, it would be nearly impossible for any city or any country to prepare for that kind of rain, you know. First of all, Dubai's infrastructure is not built for this kind of rain. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, across cities, you've got people who are knee deep in this water. You've got sort of passages and highways that were impassable. You've got cars underwater, people having to be rescued from their cars. You had people even just bringing out their, their sort of boats to, to, to just ride on the water. So this is unlike anything we've ever experienced. Yes, we do get flooded sometimes, but never this much. And across the city, you see people just reporting varying degrees of the water. You've got people whose houses, top and bottom, are already flooded. It's really devastating, honestly. You've got a lot of cars, but I have a friend, for instance, who was stuck outside all night last night whose engine is now knocked out. So a lot of oh. people will definitely be knocking on the doors of the insurance companies to say, hey, we need to make a claim. And we're, we're hoping that we never see this again anytime 
soon, at least not for maybe say a hundred years. Okay, we don't want to see this kind of rain. Well, I, don't, I, I don't know how possible that will be, Maya, because you know the way the climate is changing, uh, that will be pretty hard. Uh, that's just a prayer. We keep our fingers crossed about that. But you mentioned the insurance company. I imagine that many of them are crying over the indemnities that they have to pay at this time. I mean, because <laughs> they must have had that. Their, their, their phones must have been ringing off the hook. You know, people reporting um, the damages caused and everything else. I, I really, really can't imagine. Um, but has there been an explanation as to what happened? We know that there's a year's rainfall of water, a uh, rainfall that fell in the UAE. Uh, people are more used to heat blowing from the desert, aren't they? Um, and I imagine that there are lots of tourists. I mean, Dubai is not without tourists any season of the year. Um, this must have spoiled holiday plans for a lot of people. Definitely spoiled holiday plans for tourists. As I said, for those of us who are residents, we do get rain from time to time. Uh, very rare, but we do see rain at least a few times a year. And flooding a bit of it sometimes when we get those heavy rains. But for tourists, this would definitely be a shocker. I have gotten calls all day from friends and family across the world who are just reaching out to say, hey, we're seeing the videos, are you okay? Is everything fine? And on the one hand, sometimes I think that people who are outside the country are much more traumatized by this yeah. than those of us who live here. So I try to assure people to say, okay, yes, it, it, it is crazy, but we're safe, we're okay. Most of us are fine. And the, the good part of it is the people trust the government. They see that the government always springs to action quite promptly. So we expect that in the next few days, all agencies will have their hands on deck to make sure the flooding recedes as much as possible. You've got people pumping out water, uh, trying to clear out the drainage. So that's one big advantage in this whole situation, the fact that you've got a government that is very proactive, very efficient. And I think that's a huge plus for the city and the country at large. Yeah, and hopefully, Mayawai, you do already have your pantry full of all of your needs <laughs> food-wise until this water goes down. I just imagine the airport was grounded yesterday as a result of the rains. Can't imagine any aircraft flying in, you know, that intensity of the rainfall. Is it up and running now? Uh, and are there are the runways still flooded? This must have greatly also impacted on flight schedules. Uh, lots of chaos in the airport, I would imagine. Lots of videos of people stranded at the airport last night. Taxis found it difficult to move. So a lot of people who didn't have their own cars were stranded just trying to figure out how do I get away from the airport back home. Uh, we've got reports of about 900 flights either cancelled or diverted. So it's definitely not a great time to be flying. I know someone who was supposed to fly out of the country today. That flight's now being cancelled as you'll need to reschedule. The airport, it would take time for all that water to go away. So definitely give it another day or two. We do not have any official reports yet as to when operations will be back in full swing. But we do expect that with the level of efficiency that we know the the municipality um, always displays, let's say a day or two, we expect that things should begin to get back into full swing. But as of now, the airport is not a place to go to. I, I can imagine, Maya, I think the picture we have on our screen showing our viewers is uh, just an a, a eyewitness video of the airport itself, what it looked like. You, the place almost that I almost thought that was a sea actually in my I, I thought that was a sea and I was wondering what the aircrafts were doing on the sea so when I'm looking at just a few days two or three days I, I'm thinking we're thinking a week before this clears out hopefully you know everything returns to normal uh, hopefully we, you, the UAE recovers from this Maya thank you again for speaking with us and do stay safe in Dubai Moving on to Chhattisgarh in central India, where security forces have killed 29 Maoist rebels, including two senior members. The incident took place in Kanka area, close to Bastar, which is a stronghold of the rebels. It's coming days before the country goes to polls on Friday. The first of the general elections, the polls begin in Kanka, however, 
on April 26. The crash happened after security forces received a tip-off about the presence of leaders from the banned communist part of India, that is the Maoists in Kanka. A gunfight broke out during the search operation by forces and after that, 29 bodies of Maoist rebels and a large cache of arms were recovered. State police claim this is the highest number of Maoist casualties in a clash in recent years. Chhattisgarh has seen a long-running insurgency by Maoists who say they're fighting for the rights of the poor. The Maoist insurgency began in West Bengal state in the late 1960s and has since spread to more than a third of India's 600 districts. A hush money trial for former U.S. President Donald Trump is ongoing as the court in New York selects a jury. For a second day on Tuesday, the former president appeared in court. Before he went in, though, he expressed his grievance to the press, accusing the judge of being conflicted. He even announced current President Joe Biden as the worst president in the history of our country. Trump's words here. Inside the court, however, Trump met a stern rebuke from the jurors presiding over the trial with a judge warning, I won't have any jurors intimidated in this courtroom. So far, only seven jurors have been selected in the trial of the former president. And these ones go through the lawyers grilling about their social media posts, their political views and personal lives. The panelists who were selected are an information technology worker, an English teacher, an oncology nurse, a sales professional, a software engineer, and two lawyers. The trial needs 11 people to be sworn in before opening statements begin as early as next week in the first criminal trial of a former commander-in-chief of the United States. One person who will not be making the list is Kara McGee, who was dismissed from jury duty on the second day of the selection process. She described her experience after seeing Trump in court as seeing someone considered larger than life. Trump faces charges related to a hush money payment to an adult film star. The 34-count felony indictment alleges that the former president falsified business records to cover up a $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election, which Trump won. The world is on fire. World War III from Ukraine to uh, the Middle East. And that's important. That's the real reason they're, they're, they're messing with Donald Trump was pointed out by Tucker Carlson. You know who I'm talking about? And Tucker Carlson began to explain, Donald Trump wants peace in Ukraine. That's why they got to get rid of him. The military industrial complex. It's a really interesting experience to get to see someone who you've seen as this extremely public figure, very larger than life in a good or bad sense. It's fascinating to get to see them looking so incredibly human. And it you kind of walk in there and it's this contrasting sense of on the one hand, this is so incredibly historical and whatever happens here, whatever the verdict here, everything is different from now on. But then on the other hand, you walk past him and it's like, oh, he's just a guy. <laughs> I'd like to update you now on our breaking news this hour. Here in Nigeria, the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja has granted the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission permission to arrest former governor of Kogi State, Yahya Bello, preparatory to his arraignment tomorrow. Justice Emeka Nwite granted the warrant at the instance of the EFCC. Now, earlier, we told you a high court sitting in Lokoja, Kogi State, had restrained the EFCC from arresting, detaining, or prosecuting the former governor. Governor. Again, the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja has granted the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission permission to arrest former Governor of Kogi State, Yahya Bello, preparatory to his arraignment tomorrow. There will be developments on that story. We'll bring, you, uh, bring them to you as soon as we have them. But back to the high to the fraud trial of the former U.S. President Donald Trump. Our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird, has been monitoring the trial for us from Washington. Maria, this trial is not open to the press, so we have to rely on what judiciary correspondents tell us happened inside the courtroom. It's day three today of jury selection. We already have seen seven lockdown. What's the update on this today?
You are correct. We've already seen several of the proposed drawers um, dismissed. And so uh, we are really in a period, I think, that uh, this is going to be a very critical case. Uh, you can see that individuals have very strong opinions, whether or not it's strong opinions in support of uh, the former president or strong opinions that might create some bias um, as, as they look at um, all the facts in this case. And so it is going to be very key and very important uh, that we begin uh, to kind of uh, take this full picture and the judge is going to be a very important part of ensuring the integrity of this case. Um, as we all know, the former president um, is typically in the spotlight in the media as a way to continue to garner his supporters. And so we're in a, a time that I think that um, is very different. Uh, we've not seen a jury selected uh, for a criminal case as it relates to the former president. We're in the midst of election season. Uh, so this is going to be highly anticipated and watched. And as you said, since the press is not allowed, uh, you can rest assured that outside of the courtroom, uh, the press is there waiting to see what any reactions. Um, and as you said, the court reporter is providing information in that regard. Yes, and the former president has always believed that this is a witch hunt. He's convinced this happening in an election year. Uh, elections happening in November. Is he more convinced about it now? That you know, it's the reality has dawned that the trial is starting. A jury is being selected. He will be forced to face um, uh, the the prosecution. How how is he how is he processing this? Well, I think the processing is going to be something that um, we'll be, begin to see through his facial expressions, through the commentary. Uh, the hope, obviously, is that this can still be an orderly process. Um, we know that the judge is going to be very much strict as regards to ensuring uh, that the integrity of the process is followed and kept to the best of possible. Uh, but the prosecution is definitely prepared. Obviously, they have uh, have tons of facts and tons of information that they plan to present and tons of evidence they plan to present. Um, and so when that begins, uh, it will definitely be something uh, that I think many uh, will not be surprised about as it relates to the reactions we will see from the former president. But again, since the press is not allowed, it will be heavily dependent upon the court reporters to provide that, which could potentially cut down on the amount of, um, of potential disruption in the courtroom. I can imagine. Walk us through, Maria, how this trial is supposed to go. Will Trump get the opportunity to defend himself? Well, it depends on if his attorney calls him to the stand. If he's called to the stand as a witness, um, then he will have an opportunity to speak on his own behalf. Um, so that'll be the piece where we will begin to see him defending himself. Other than that, um, you will be seeing him sitting there and the attorney will be providing the, sp the specific defense um, arguments as it relates to this case. So as you said, um, you know, just those uh, court and judiciary correspondents will be briefing us, you know, on what's been going on inside. Um, can we continue to discuss this trial, knowing what we know in snippets and in bits and pieces from these reports? Or will this be off limits until the trial is done? No, the court reporter will provide snippets at the end of the day. Um, if there's any redacted information, they will redact that information. But for the most part, um, the general process will be able to be available and any sort of public information that's um, deemed appropriate by the judge. But um, typically, most information is released unless there's something uh, that for the integrity of the case is not able to be released. Maria, thanks again for briefing us on this. Uh, eyes and ears on the ground, as always. Okay, Dave. We're in Africa now. The opposition in Togo has announced a proposed new constitution as a power grab intended to extend the reign of President for Nasingbe. Reforms would see the West African country move from a presidential to a parliamentary system. But the opposition says they are a ruse to keep Mr. Nasingwe already in his fourth term in power. They add that the reforms would allow him to remain president until 2031 and then be appointed to the new position of president of the Council of Ministers. In effect, Prime Minister continuing his family's 57-year rule. The constitutional changes are approved by lawmakers last month. But in the face of mounting public anger, Mr. Nsingbe 
calls for reforms, saying they would be subject to further consultations. President Nasimbe came to power in 2005 after the death of his father, who had been president since 1967. Flooding caused by heavy rains have affected large areas of Kenya, including the capital, Nairobi. At least 11 people have been killed, more than 17,000 more displaced. The rainy season that began in mid-March has damaged homes and farmlands. Those affected are appealing for urgent government assistance as hunger and the risk of disease loom. The Kenya Red Cross is helping those who have been forced from their homes and has advised those in low-lying areas to seek shelter on higher ground. The rain is forecast to last until early next week. Here's our second break now on The World Today. You don't want to stay for this one. Here's not 23, here's not 30, here's not even 50, he's 70 years old. And he's a fitness enthusiast showing off incredible strength. And he's all the way in China. Welcome back. As the conflict in Sudan enters its second year, demonstrators have gathered in Washington to call on the U.S. government and the international community to intervene. On Monday, the North African country marked the first anniversary of its ongoing civil war. Protesters included Sudanese expats held, holding Sudanese flags, placards and banners chanting all eyes on Sudan peace and justice for Sudan and stop the war now. Uh, one of them, whose cousin, according to her, was allegedly killed by the rapid support forces, the RSF, and whose family had to flee from Sudan to Egypt, is asking the U.S. to act and provide basic humanitarian needs. Another protester commented on the actions of the two warring Sudanese generals as Abdel Fattah al buran the leader of the Sudanese armed forces, and Mohammed Hamdan Degalo, also known as Hemeti, the head of the paramilitary RSF, who were both part of the 2021 coup, which removed Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok. He believes both men should be put under arrest. After one year of war, over 8.4 million people have been forced to leave their homes, both inside and outside the country, making Sudan have the highest rates for international displacement in the world. At least 15,000 people have reportedly been killed in Sudan since the fighting between the Sudanese armed forces and the RSF erupted last April. We hope that the U.S. and other countries can persuade these to stop In fact, I believe both of the generals who are leading it should be put under arrest and tried by the International Criminal Court. I am here today um, just to basically, you know, highlight what's going on specifically in Sudan when it comes to all that is going on in human rights right now. The RSF has killed my cousin, of course, right here, Gathag, and then also my family, my aunt right here, her children right here. They fled. They are displaced. They're now living in, um, they're now living in um, Egypt because of all that has happened in Sudan. We're still supporting them. So we're asking for the U.S. to act to basically give the basic human necessities, such as, such as food, such as housing, such as school, and just to do what is right and stop these guys, these guys are bad guys. Health authorities in South Africa are expressing concern over the rise in food poisoning cases after more than 40 toddlers were taken to hospital when they mistook rat poison for sweets. 17 of them were kept overnight for observation, while 24 were released to go home after health authorities in Hauteng deemed the condition satisfactory. In a separate incident, a group of 10 people, including eight children, were referred to a different hospital in the same province. South Africa health authorities have reported a total of 863 such incidents since last October. They're advising parents and guardians now to take greater care to protect their children and hurry anyone with food poison symptoms such as nausea, diarrhea, vomiting and stomach aches to the nearest health centre. 
Staying in South Africa, though, the country is hosting the 2024 South Africa-China Jobs Fair underway at the Gallagher Convention Center in Midrand, Pretoria. More than 70 Chinese-invested companies operating in South Africa are participating in the job fair. Those behind the event say it's positioned to address the challenges of unemployment and address the country's economic recovery, growth and development. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Samosa, reports from the venue. In a bid to address the pressing challenge of unemployment in South Africa, some 77 plus Chinese businesses based in South Africa are offering locals about 6,000 jobs in the next three years. The tech Chinese investing enterprises and strengths from both South Africa and China for their banking participation and strong support. The warm up stress recorded important scenes from President Xi Jinping's visit to South Africa and Mass Harpers there. So this relationship is a very strong relationship. There are lessons that must be learned. China itself, you know in its history, comes from a history of what used to be called backwaters at the time. But look at how far it has gone in growing its own economy, in building infrastructure, in having new industries. Those are the lessons that we have to learn, but learning is a two-way process. I asked the minister in the presidency, Marubini Ramahopa, to find out whether or not these Chinese businesses comply with South Africa's labor laws, and this is what she had to say. There have been, um, of course, and I know why you are asking that, there have been uh, instances where um, there were uh, um, not necessarily adherence to all the labor laws of South Africa because if you know, I mean, companies that come here would come with their own cultures and their own understanding and when they come here then they don't do exactly what is it that we need. But what we have been able to do is that we are continuously engaging with the embassy, we are continuously engaging with um, the, the formation that deals with um, or that is housing all these companies. We have the company values and, uh, and people is a very important size and uh, it's one of our company value. So we're always caring for people, uh, also including the environment. Uh, so that's why we always thinking people is more important for, for the company. And we're always looking, you know, the talent, especially support the local uh, education, also the local employment. Some unemployed young people say this is a step in the right direction. There's nothing as painful as studying and then you don't get a job. So this initiative at least brings hope, this hope for the future, especially for upcoming graduates, because at least there's something they will get. It is a good initiative because um, for some youth, others I think they didn't come here for nothing. Others are going to be employed, I'm really sure, because I did civil engineering. I only saw three uh, companies that are dealing with civil engineering. Let's hope that this event won't just be a talk shop with empty timelines and no clear direction. From Pretoria, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channels Television News. Oh, you may have noticed the ripped muscles and abs on the next uh, person we're about to talk about. 70-year-old uh, Zhuo Guoping, a resident and fitness enthusiast from Chongqing, China. He has been astonishing locals due to his incredible strength and ability to perform calisthen calisthenics exercises despite his age. Remember, he's 70 years old. Wu Ping can be seen performing exercises including pull-ups, handstands, pole climbing. Apart from these classic exercises, he's also performed a series of less conventional looking exercises such as jumping up steps of Gele Mountain, only to crawl back on his hands and feet all the way down. He says he's been doing physical exercises for the past 45 years, and that after his retirement, he'll have enough time to continue with his fitness routine. He advises people who follow a healthy way of life to be persistent and to keep their focus on their fitness routine. Hey, 
that has got to be the most fit 70 year old I have ever seen. Thank you for watching the world today. Just before we go, our breaking news is Sal. We had a development. A high court sitting in Lokajakogi State restrained the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission from arresting, detaining, or prosecuting former Kogi State Governor. Yahaya Bello. Order follows a suit by the former governor seeking to enforce his fundamental rights against the EFCC and comes as operatives continue their siege on the Wusei Zone 4 residence uh, of the former governor. Uh, the update, however, is that the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja granted the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission permission to arrest the former governor. Justice Emekawite granted the warrant on the instance of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Thanks for watching The World Today. I'm Amarachi Rebecca.